Good evening and welcome. My name is Eric Banks. I'm the director of the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight to the state of surveillance, legal, cultural, and technological perspectives. Uh, it's such a huge turnout. We're really happy to have you here uh, this evening. It may seem just a slight bit unexpected for an institute with the word humanities at its core to be co-hosting these proceedings this evening. But surveillance is an issue that not only matches the complexity of the various disciplinary perspectives that comprise the humanities, it is a topic that many different disciplines may and should shed light on. Surveillance is an issue not just of law and politics, but also philosophy and ethics. It asks in fundamental ways how technology relates to the human body and serves human communication, and to what extent technological change might alter our very notions of who we are in the 21st century. Whether we're sovereign actors with inalienable rights to privacy or agglomerations of fungible data, and how these two notions might interact and inform each other as we move forward into both the course of the century. It is a topic that has been and will continue to be addressed by social historians as well as artists and writers, many of whom were asking questions about how surveillance affects the ways we define ourselves, which is at the very heart of the humanities, well before we became familiar with the name Edward Snowden. Um, I think of many different disciplines and the way that they've treated surveillance over the years. Um, I think of an important issue in art history from the past several decades, which Jonathan Perry called the techniques of the observer. And more recently, I think of the A1 headlines about diplomatic rifts between the US and other countries over surveillance and the long shadows they cast over the C1 reviews of The Circle, Dave Eggers' new novel of Big Brother Corporations in the Age of Big Data. Surveillance opens up the very breach between what we think and what we do, between our ideals and our behavior, and thus it's a proper topic both for sociology and philosophy. Where a vast number of us have been appalled to learn the extent of government surveillance programs, an equally great number of people aren't bothered at all by the prospect of giving away any amount of personal information in exchange for easy driving directions, Amazon recommendations for their next purchase, and the socially satisfying bonds of sharing with any number of virtual friends. If there's ever a topic that begs us to think about it within the vast, from within the vast framework of the humanities, it is the topic of surveillance. And I suspect that in the coming years, it will affect how the humanities and the disciplines that comprise the humanities will continue to divide themselves. This is all grist for the mill of many, 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 many other panels. Uh, but I wanted to just uh, introduce this as a way of introducing our panel tonight, uh, because I think it will give us a taste of just how complex the topic is, and will prompt us to think about it in multiple ways as we uh, begin our panel this evening. Our panelists tonight will accordingly approach surveillance from a number of perspectives, um, as uh, you know from the title, legal, cultural, and technological. Um, I want to thank them uh, now all for giving their time to be with us this evening, and thank you for coming out. I'd like to take this opportunity, too, to thank as well our co-sponsors, uh, the Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU and the Brennan Center for Justice at the NYU School of Law. Two individuals at the IPK and the New York Institute for the Humanities deserve special praise for their work. Stephanie Steiker, the Associate Director of the New York Institute for the Humanities, and Jessica Coffey, uh, Program Manager of the IPK, uh, are the true brains behind this event. Uh, they both put in a tremendous amount of work to put together tonight's panels, and I'd like to say thank you to them both. We have an illustrious group of panelists joining us uh, this evening, who I'll uh, now introduce in alphabetical order. Dana Boyd is a principal researcher at Microsoft Research, a research assistant professor in media, culture, and communication at NYU, and a fellow at Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society. She's written extensively on social media and the intersections of society and technology. Carrie Cordero is Director of National Security Studies at Georgetown University Law School and served for a decade in national security related policy and operational legal positions at the Department of Justice. Peter Moss is a journalist and author who has contributed to a range of magazines and newspapers, including the New York Times Magazine, for which he recently profiled Laura Poitras, a key figure in the recent revelations of Edward Snowden. He is at work on a book about surveillance and privacy. A.L. Press is a journalist and most recently the author of Beautiful Souls, a book about individual acts of conscience and resistance, and is currently a visiting scholar at the Institute for Public Knowledge. Our moderator tonight is Faisal Patel of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law, where she is co-director of the Liberty and National Security Program. 
She has also served as the senior policy officer at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons at The Hague. We owe her and uh, Dana Boyd a special thank you. Uh, Dana agreed to join us on very short notice after our scheduled moderator, Clay Shirky, had to cancel. Um, and Faiza also agreed to step in to moderate tonight's discussion. So we thank you both. Following the panel discussion uh, in the final quarter hour of our event, we welcome you to ask any questions you might have for our panelists. Um, I'd like to now take the opportunity to ask you to check and make sure that your portable GPS tracking systems are turned <laughs> off. And now I'm happy to welcome Faiza Patel. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Faiza Patel, and I'm really excited to be here tonight uh, because of my wonderful uh, co-panelists, but also because to see all of you here and, and the interest that you're expressing in this subject. So my job today is to introduce the topic at hand, the state of surveillance. I'm going to start with a little bit of history. <clears throat> the last time government surveillance was so completely at the center of the public debate was back in the 1970s when a congressional committee led by Senator Frank Church uncovered massive illegal spying by the intelligence agencies. All the major agencies, including the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA, were found to have spied on Americans based on their political beliefs. This was also, you'll recall, the time of Watergate and Nixon. Now, in the wake of these scandals, a slew of reforms was enacted, which defined our national security structure, and particularly the surveillance aspects of it, for the next decades. The basic premise of this structure was that the security agencies should not spy on Americans unless they had some reason to suspect them of wrongdoing. When it came to foreign spies operating here in the United States, Congress recognized that some flexibility was required. It set up something called the FISA Court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act Court. It's actually called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Um, which we'll come back to a bit later. And the job of this court was basically to review and approve wiretaps of persons who were thought to be agents of foreign governments. The goal here was to balance the need to conduct foreign intelligence and the rights of Americans to be secure in their communications at home. Now, I think we all know that after 9-11, the structure unraveled. Standards were loosened across the board to allow more flexibility on the part of security agencies to conduct surveillance. The touchstone of individualized suspicion gave way. As this was happening, dozens of books were written about the growth of the surveillance state. The issue, though, didn't really seem to resonate with Americans. There was a, an outburst back um, around 2005 when B the Bush administration's warrantless wiretapping program was, re was revealed. But it, it died down, and the, the, the public imagination didn't really uh, get engaged with this issue. But Snowden changed all of that, and now we're all here today to talk about what he told us about surveillance and what we, that makes us think about whistleblowers and the role of the press and all of these really interesting issues. Now, I find that the stories about the NSA are sort of gushing out at us. You know, every week or two, you know, Bart Gelman or Glenn Greenwald has some new revelation. Um, and, they're, and they're all revealing different pieces of the programs that are being conducted. So I thought I would start by just highlighting two of the big programs. There are a lot of other bits and pieces out there, but I think these are really the crux of the two programs. So um, the first one is the Telephony Metadata Program. Um, this program uh, collects all or almost all uh, records of Americans' phone calls. It is conducted under something that's called Section 215 of the Patriot Act. And this is important. You have to remember Section 215, because Carrie's going to talk about it in a few minutes. Um, the Patriot Act, as you may recall, was passed shortly after 9-11. Um, the text of 215 is up on the screen. What it does is that it allows the government to get at what they call tangible things, and that means business records, among other things, that are relevant to international terrorism investigations and the like. Now, the government has taken the position that all American phone records are relevant to international terrorism investigations. The FISA court, which I mentioned a little while earlier, 
oversees this program and has agreed with the government's position. But many lawmakers and legal scholars have challenged this interpretation on the grounds that it stretches the definition of the word relevant beyond recognition. It is certainly a far cry from the individualized suspicion that used to be the hallmark of our surveillance law. Now, the second set of programs, and I say programs because there are bits and pieces that we've learned about these, collect the actual content of communications. So section 215 is collecting the records, who you called, when you called, things, for how long, things like that. The second set of programs is collecting what's in those communications, and that's not just telephone calls, but also emails, um, uh, login information, save files, audio video files, just a range of things. PRISM is one of these programs which many of you may have heard of. The legal basis of this is something called Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act. Now this provision is meant to allow the government to get at, in, in, at intelligence about foreign targets, right? This program is all about getting information about foreign targets who are overseas. It's not supposed to be about getting information about Americans, and it's not supposed to be about getting information about people who are here. But the programs inevitably pick up a great deal of information about Americans. We don't actually know how much. Um, there have been calls for the government to release this information over the last couple of years, but it hasn't yet come to light. I'm gonna put up one slide that gives you a sense of the scope of one piece of these programs. The, this is a program that's called Boundless Informant, um, which picks up com the content of communications. You'll see, it, it's a lovely map. Uh, <laughs> the places where it's picking up the most communications are the places in red. Uh, the ones which are slightly less are orange, and so on and so forth. You'll see that the US is highlighted in orange. Now, I don't want to mislead you because this doesn't necessarily tell you that it's picking up Americans' communications because it's kind of hard to tell sometimes where a communication is coming from, but it gives you some sense of the scope. So Boundless Informant picked up three billion pieces of data from US computer networks over one 30-day period. This is the scope of the programs we're talking about. So that's the programs. I mean, obviously they raise many, many issues, but I wanna highlight four. The first one is oversight. Now, <clears throat> when these programs first came to light, President Obama went out and said, you shouldn't be worried about this, American people, because these programs are being conducted with full oversight by Congress and by the FISA court. Now, there's no question that Congress passed the laws under which these programs are conducted. Congress passed the Patriot Act. Congress passed the FISA Amendments Act. This is clearly no question about that. But that being said, there is a lot of concern in Congress about how these provisions are being interpreted, particularly with respect to Section 215, which is the telephone metadata program. The lead, one of the lead sponsors of the Patriot Act has actually repudiated the interpretation that the FISA court and the administration have taken of that provision. And just a couple of months ago, um, <clears throat> there was a vote uh, on an amendment to an appropriations bill which would have shut down that program, which came within seven votes of passing in the House. Now, things don't pass in the House that easily, as you uh, may be aware. So that does tell you uh, that there is a high level of concern, at least about that one program in Congress. Now, the other piece of oversight is obviously this FISA court that I've alluded to throughout this conversation. Now, this was a court that was set up to hear government applications for spying on foreign agents. It now supervises both the program that collects Americans' telephone records and the program that collects content over the internet. Until Edward Snowden came on the scene and started releasing documents, we had only seen two opinions from this court. Since then, the government has released a number of opinions. These opinions, in my view, are a bit of a two-edged sword. Um, what do we have up? Okay. Uh, on the one hand, uh, they show us that the court can clamp down on the government when it finds out that they have violated its orders. On the other hand, they show that the court only ever really finds out about violations when the government itself discovers them. 
and reports them to the court, and sometimes this is years, the violations have gone on for several years. And the court has actually been quite harsh with the government, and I put up a few quotes, uh, one set on the Section 215 programs and one on the 702 programs, where you see the court really kind of angry that the government has not complied with the terms of its previous orders and really feeling that the government has misled it. This is the primary oversight mechanism over these programs. Um, the second issue I just want to highlight is secrecy. The FISA court operates in secret. What does that mean? It operates ex parte. The government makes applications for the kinds of surveillance it wants to conduct, and often these are applications for entire programs, not an individualized warrant application of the kind you think of in the sort of regular criminal context, but just generally the entire program. Um, the companies who are required to assist the government in picking up this data are allowed to appear before the court, but the public is not. And perhaps most importantly, the court's opinions are entirely secret. We only had two over the, from 1978 until this year that were released. And this is important because those opinions not only authorize specific programs, but they also constitute the law, the law about what the government can and cannot collect about Americans. Now, we all, I think, can agree that some level of secrecy is important, and, and we need secrecy to protect sensitive government operations. But I think it's, it's an important question for us to think about as to whether or not the law that governs these operations should be kept secret in a democracy. Um, and this is, I think, one of the uh, pieces which takes us into the role of whistleblowers and the role of the press to bringing these issues out into the public domain. Two more quick things, harm and abuses. Back when we were talking about the church committee, the abuses were very apparent. We knew at the end of the day what had been done with the data. We knew that they were trying to um, target civil rights leaders, anti-war activists, um, various other unpopular groups. We don't know that yet about this programs. There have been indications of some abuses, but honestly, they've been relatively limited. Um, on the other hand, we've never had a full investigation. We haven't had the equivalent of a church committee, which took months and months and used subpoenas to actually get at what was going on in the intelligence community. But secondly, and, and this is a broader point that I hope that we get to in the course of this discussion, is what does it mean for a democracy to know that the government is watching and listening to you? How does it affect dissent? How does it affect people whose views are outside the mainstream? How does it affect all of those First Amendment values that are so dear to our hearts? And lastly, I want to touch on the issue of efficacy. How useful are these programs? Many lawmakers have questioned particularly how useful Section 215 collection has been. Um, do we just wait? Um, do we just rely on what the NSA tells us when they tell us, you know, these programs are useful, they have helped us? Or, or do we want something more than that when you're talking about collecting information about Americans who are not suspected of any wrongdoing? So that's a little bit the landscape um, of these programs. And now I'm going to turn it over to the other panelists who will be exploring aspects of these issues and details. And we're going to start with Carrie. Oops. Well, thank you very much, Fiza, and um, thank you to NYU's Institute for Public Knowledge and the Brennan Center for Justice for inviting me uh, tonight to this discussion. Having spent my undergraduate days up Broadway at Barnard, um, I'm always happy to have any excuse to come up from Washington to New York. So um, thank you for giving me uh, that excuse tonight. The topic of tonight's event, in terms of the state of surveillance, What's interesting about that is that the state of surveillance seems to be somewhat of a moving target. In just the few weeks since NYU extended this invitation to come tonight, there have been more unauthorized disclosures of classified information, more sensitive information published, and therefore more reactions um, and determinations of sort of what all of this means. So in my few minutes that I have um, to address you now, I'd like to hit on three main points. Um, First, in as brief a way as possible, I'd like to address the arguments that the surveillance activities by the intelligence community are illegal, because there are strong arguments that the activities are, in fact, 
legal. And if we start from that premise, I think there actually can be a more substantive conversation about how we can continue important foreign intelligence gathering that protects the country in a way that restores public confidence. To advance that point, secondly, I'd like to talk briefly about the oversight structure um, and dive a little bit deeper, um, picking up on some of FISA's um, remarks on the oversight, because the oversight structure really should give Americans confidence that the government is not abusing the legal authorities that it's been granted. And third, I'd like to raise the issue of what it means for something such as an activity or a disclosure or reporting to be in the public interest, um, because that issue is one that we're going to continue to uh, be looking at, in, looking at in the coming days, months, and years. So first, legality. From my perspective, the arguments that these programs, and I'm referring to specifically what FISA described as the 702 and the 215 program, um, are illegal, are mostly arguments about what the law should be and not arguments about what the law is today. The analysis under each of these two sections is a different one, and the government's interpretation of section 215 is uh, a more forward-leaning interpretation than is its interpretation of 702. But generally, the arguments that either or both of these programs may be unlawful focus on the changes to technology, the differences in how our information is retained, and how we communicate today versus decades ago, and on the Fourth Amendment concept concerning what constitutes a reasonable expectation of privacy. Section 702 collection is targeted against non-US persons reasonably believed to be outside the United States. These are not individuals with constitutional protections, and the collection against them is conducted in accordance with the statutory framework passed by Congress in the FISA Amendments Act of 2008. The FISA Amendments Act actually enhanced protections for US persons, that includes um, citizens or resident aliens uh, worldwide, by requiring that an individual probable cause-based order be obtained from the court for electronic surveillance or physical search, no matter where in the world that US person is located. And the minimization procedures governing 702 collection have now been declassified and demonstrate the detailed procedures with which NSA handles US person information. The 702 framework was debated extensively and publicly, and Congress has been kept informed of its implementation in accordance with the reporting provisions that are in law. With respect to the metadata collection under Section 215, it is a fair characterization that this is a very large program in scale. But the government's arguments in this case are consistent with existing precedent, no matter what direction the courts may go in the future. Although it may sound surprising, current Supreme Court precedent still holds that there is no expectation of privacy in our telephone metadata. That is, the numbers that we dial or numbers that dial us and a warrant is not required to obtain this information. Likewise, Supreme Court precedent also still holds that we do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in records voluntarily turned over to a third party, like a communications company. The FISA court released a declassified opinion and, or and order by Judge Claire Egan at the end of August, approving continuation of the business records, the 215 metadata program. Judge Egan offered a straightforward analysis of the law and found that under both the Constitution and statute, the programs are lawful. Judge Egan's analysis was recently adopted by another judge of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, Judge Mary McLaughlin. Uh, that opinion was also recently declassified, who similarly found that the production of call detail records is not a search under the Fourth Amendment. Judge McLaughlin's uh, opinion was released on October 18th, and she also distinguished a case that a number of people have been discussing recently, which is the 2012 United States versus Jones case. She distinguished that case by saying that that case concerned a different type of surveillance that was collecting a different type of information. It may be, as Judge McLaughlin also noted in her opinion, that over the course of the next several years or longer, that courts, including the Supreme Court, may come to different conclusions about expectation of privacy that may impact intelligence collection under FISA. That may well happen, but the current collection activities, based on the court's opinions and accompanying materials that have been declassified by the government, are consistent with current precedent and existing interpretations of the law. Now, turning to the oversight structure, um, 
One aspect of the government's foreign intelligence activities and the NSA activities that have been discussed in particular um, is the oversight structure, which has not gotten as much attention as, uh, as, as I think it might have. So the oversight structure that's in place with respect to these activities should give people confidence that the activities currently being conducted by the intelligence community are not analogous to the abuses that we know occurred in the 1970s, nor are they comparable to concerns that New Yorkers in particular may have regarding NYPD intelligence division surveillance activities, which are now back in the news in light of a new book, and FISA and the Brennan Center also published a report on that calling for an inspector general, which now it looks like will take place um, in January. Um, and so there is a, a, a big difference between that type of surveillance activities versus what the federal government's doing. So to drill down a little bit as quickly as I can on some of the oversight structures, uh, here we go. There are laws such as the National Security Act of 1947, the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004, FISA. There are executive orders, Executive Order 12333, which has been exist in existence since 1981. And then there are attorney general approved guidelines under that executive order that govern intelligence community operations and the collection of intelligence information and the protection of US person information. And all of the intelligence community elements that conduct intelligence have to have rules that protect US person information that are approved by the attorney general. Moving on to then the oversight with respect to these particular programs that occurs within the executive branch. There are offices of general counsel, offices of compliance, civil liberties and protection offices, inspectors general. Outside, and that's within each collecting um, intelligence community element. Then when you move sort of broader into the executive branch, there's the Department of Justice that conducts oversight. Um, through the National Security Division and through senior leadership. The new Director of National Intelligence which, uh, was passed in 2004, created in 2004, through their Office of General Counsel and Civil Liberties Protection Officer. The President's Intelligence Oversight Board, which looks at compliance, and the pre new President's Civil Liberties and Oversight Board. That's just in the executive branch. Then within the judicial branch, we have the FISA Court and the appellate level, the FISA Court of Review. And then there are congressional intelligence um, committees. So that gives you a, uh, a, a taste, at least, of some of the oversight. I'd like to say a final word about public interest. Um, last week, it was reported that Glenn Greenwald, the reporter who, along with documentary producer Laura Poitras, facilitated the publication of documents that Snowden leaked, is going to start up a new media enterprise. And their financier, who's the founder of eBay, has said, quote, that he developed an interest in supporting independent journalists in a way that leverages their work to the greatest extent possible, all in support of the public interest, unquote. Certainly the re recent releases have been done under the claim of public interest. But although there are valid arguments that in hindsight, perhaps the government could have been, done a better job in explaining some of this, I would submit that the leakers and the journalists who assist them and their up and coming financiers do not have the monopoly on deciding what is in the public interest. What seems to be missing from the current conversation is that oh, there also is a public interest, and I would submit a very foundational and strong one, in being safe. And so although some Americans might be uncomfortable or downright angry about the extent of some of, some of NSA's activities and that they are conducted in secret, the fact that they are conducted in secret is exactly the bargain that was struck in the late 1970s when Congress created the intelligence committees and passed the FISA. And so I would submit that there's a legitimate argument that Americans should be equally uncomfortable or perhaps even angry that their government's ability to collect intelligence in support of national security is being compromised. Further, some of the information that's come out has zero or very little arguably public interest, uh, interest in being made public and arguably a very high risk in compromising important foreign intelligence capabilities that protect the country and New York from another devastating attack. As more and more of some of this type of information comes out, it seems like some of this is more perhaps about selling newspapers or generating hits on websites than it is about the public interest. What the intelligence community does and what it needs to do today in the days, months, and years to come is to stay ahead of terrorists and nation states that want to damage this country and hurt its citizens. 
and that means staying ahead of how these adversaries think about attacking us, whether that is by bringing down buildings, attacking our financial system or internet commerce through a cyber attack, or launching a Mumbai or Nairobi-style attack in a mall here in America. So I'd like to put that public interest on the table tonight. Thank you, Carrie. Um, Dana? Good evening. <clears throat> you may notice that I have uh, a lot more hair and a lot higher pitched voice than who I was supposed to be on this panel. And um, <laughs> I'm going to do my best to sort of reflect on some of the things that I know Clay would have brought to the table, um, although I will not do it in as brilliant a way as my friend and colleague is able to do. Most of my work actually looks at these issues from a much more sociological and cultural perspective, but I am uh, grateful to be surrounded by a lot of computer scientists on a day-to-day -day basis, and I've spent the, the entire summer basically debating different aspects of technology with them. So I want to raise today two of the key issues that I keep hearing from the technical communities and the concerns and anxieties um, about the different revelations that we have seen. The first one I want to raise is, is the issues that have come up within the cryptography community. Now, the cryptography community is a very interesting one and has a very fraught relationship with the NSA and other government um, agencies. Um, and it's known, first and foremost, especially to the public eye, for its paranoia, some of which is actually very well um, intended, some of which has some questionable directions to it. Not surprisingly, um, the crypto community has reacted strongly over the past summer um, to the different kinds of revelations that we have seen, um, both for the ways in which it has reaffirmed some of the most extreme paranoid sensibilities and for the ways in which it has actually shown some of the possible weaknesses within our own architecture, some of the things that we assume to be technologically solid, which we are now coming to question whether or not that's actually true. The major concern from the crypto community comes down to the possibility that there are back doors, um, especially with regard to the ability to produce random numbers. Now, for those who are not familiar with how cryptography works, random numbers are actually a critical component of making certain that actually cryptography stays secure. Without random numbers, it's actually extraordinarily difficult to pr um, produce uh, secure keys. But the thing is, is that randomness within a technical architecture isn't actually easy. And it's the weakest point within a cryptography system is to make certain that you can produce random keys. And so this is one of the big challenges that has emerged for, for decades now of trying to figure out how to actually provide security. Now, there's, if you think about a computer, one of the things is that they're trying to figure out how to produce randomness. Now, we're talking about a machine. Machines are not architected to necessarily produce randomness. And so it actually relies on one of two really dominant paradigms, um, at least currently, that are used. One is to actually get at the mechanics of the device itself in order to assume that the mechanical aspects of it will produce a level of randomness that can be inserted in to produce a random number generator. And the second is the possibility of using elliptic curves as another way of getting it, which is, this is a mathematical function that is extraordinarily important. Now, each of these requires a certain level of trust within the crypto community in order to assume that this randomness is actually working. If you're relying on the mechanics, um, mechanical approaches of two things, you actually have to rely that the computer manufacturers, the people who are building the systems themselves, are doing it in a way where they're not allowing certain rhythmic patterns to happen. This is actually really hard because a lot of systems automatically produce rhythms, which results in non-random randomness. Um, <laughs> kind of messy. The other thing is, is that with elliptic curves, we've actually created a whole standards body. And for those who aren't aware of how the um, National Institute on Standards and Technology works, a lot of it is that they um, build out different kinds of things. For example, they measure the length of a foot. And that becomes the length of the foot that we measure everything else based on. Well, they also are the ones that hold on to the mathematics around elliptic curves that we, we um, make our randomness related to. So now, what happens here is that when these things start to actually get uh, corrupted in different ways, either because of an accident in terms of how these things are mechanically built, or because there's the possibility that backdoors are built into them, we lose the trust in actually the ability to build randomness. And we lose, fundamentally, the ability to think about cryptography in a technical sense. This is I, at the heart of a lot of what the anxiety within the cryptography community is right now, is the question of what kinds of backdoors have been built in. Now, don't get me wrong, there's been accidents with regard to cryptography for a long time. And one of the things you will find, both black hats and white hats in the hacker community will work to find these kinds of bugs and report them and fix them. Yet now there's a, a, a level of anxiety of who's actually doing the reporting, who's doing the fixing, and can this fix actually stay to be true? 
Should the NSA be purposefully eroding the security of cryptography raises serious complications. Whether they're doing it for their own gain, but what would be the implications writ large both for the advancements of science and technology and for the ability to think about secure communications beyond what is necessary for national security. Now the other sort of key anxiety point that has emerged within the technical community has to do with the role of metadata. Over and over again, as all of these news stories have unfolded, we keep hearing representatives of the government try to assure the American public that metadata is not data. And most of the computer scientists that I'm surrounded by are scratching their head just going, why do people believe this? And it's the realization that people don't understand what metadata is and how much can be done with metadata. Now, in 1979, the Supreme Court ruled um, that while people have the right to privacy over the communication um, that they have, particularly with regard to telephony, which is where the, the basis of this comes from, they don't have the right to um, uh, privacy with regard to the fact that a call was made, right? The fact that this is a point-to-point -point conversation, when the, data, when the conversation happened, where the conversation happened, et cetera. Now, since the 1970s, we've actually come a long way in using metadata. And one of the things that you might hear is when you hear the notion of the big data phenomenon, it's really about the possibility of using metadata to actually get an amazing amount of information about what's going on out there. Now, just consider, for example, your phone calls. When you call a person, how long um, you take that call and where you call that person are all metadata. Now, if you're calling Pizza Hut at, you know, uh, for two minutes at, sh at 7 p.m., there's a pretty reasonable assumption that you're probably ordering pizza, right? Um, but the question is, what else can be discerned by the kinds of calls you're making? Again, think simplicity. What happens when you're calling a cancer treatment center? What happens when you're calling a criminal lawyer? What can be discerned by the length of conversation you have, by the timing of that conversation? What happens when it gets interpreted, and who is doing that interpretation? Who has the right to the interpretation, and who is checking the accuracy of that interpretation? Network analysis allows us to build complex graphs of who knows who. Now this is actually at the core of some of your favorite social media, right? One of the reasons why Facebook is so intriguing to people is the idea that you can actually see who's related to each other and the ability to actually make visible the relationships we have um, writ large. But the thing about your phone records is that your phone records are a much better portrait of the kinds of relationships you actually have because they're behavioral. They say not only are you who you're in conversation with directly, but who you share a cell tower with, which says who you spend time with. And we can start to discern these connections between people. When the government has access to the phone records, they actually know who you're connected to, who you're actually spending time with, um, as well as how long and in what place and at what time. It doesn't take a lot to assume guilt through association, which is one of the reasons we get to this point of anxiety about who is actually doing the check and balance of making certain that that, inf that inference is actually uh, coming from a grounded point of view. Now, a month ago, the head of the NSA confirmed that indeed the NSA stores and, um, uh, all records of American citizens' phone, converse, or phone uh, graphs and phone, phone information. This means that they actually have a very sophisticated mapping um, of um, the networks within the American population under the guise of security. And I have to say that this, the fact that we've been doing this, this has been happening for a long time, and I think one of the things that's odd for me in watching this play out is I actually started doing network analysis in the mid-90s, and in 2001, um, I had a nice knock on the door from a lot of Department of Defense people wanting to use my work. So I'm not surprised by the fact that we've come this way. But the thing is, is that we've come a long way computationally where it's really possible to discern an amazing amount of inform information about people based on what they do. This is where we start to see it within the business community. I don't know how many of you saw the New York Times article about how you know, Target knows that you know, a young girl is pregnant, again, through metadata. We start to see the possibilities of what is known or what is interpreted that way. Large-scale metadata is actually often more informative than the content itself. And it's really important to realize that even as the population doesn't understand what's going on. Now, don't get me wrong. Metadata can actually be used for a tremendous amount of public good. And that's actually where we're seeing this sort of interesting tension emerge. In the, in the work that I do, I've been engaging a lot on projects related to human trafficking. And one of the things that's been fascinating is to watch banking industry start to use the metadata that they have to actually discern whether or not trafficking is occurring. And one of the places that you start to see this is when you start to see $100 spa uh, visits at 4 a.m. on a nightly basis, you know somebody's not getting a mani-pedi. So really, what's happening? And that's where we're starting to see that be used for, for um, some sort of public good. But the question comes into play of what are the checks and balances to that? How does this data get abused? Who is actually making certain to assess it? 
And this is actually what I think is at the core of these issues, especially in the technology community. The possibility that this, um, this technology or the data could be corrupted or manipulated, undermined or backdoor is really what's at stake. The issue is really comes down to how we construct our democracy. The promise of the American Constitution is the commitment to checks and balances. And in order to have a really healthy uh, democracy, we also need to know that there are checks to power and that they are continuously updated in light of what's going on. The same technologies that can be used to empower um, and address societal issues can be twisted to abuse people. And the thing is, is that the population doesn't necessarily know or have the technological savvy to be able to assess which is which. And one of the depressing things coming from the technology community is that we also don't trust that our government understands the technical issues well enough to actually necessarily be operating as a proxy for a lot of this. The summer of surveillance has called into question the very existence of the checks and balances. And the question of who's holding the government accountable, who's making sure that the NSA isn't abusing its power, who's making certain that the interpretations that are done on a regular basis are accurate. From a technology perspective, any effort to uh, fundamentally undermine core technical security or dupe the American public into thinking that metadata isn't real data um, suggests that the government is abusing its power. Secrecy is, of course, how we get to totalitarianism, an informed citizenry as how we actually start to maintain our democracy. The question is, is as a technologically moving situation, how do we make certain that we're all well informed about what's going on in order to be a check to power? Thank you, Dana. Peter. Thank you. Um, so, I was planning on riffing, but I'm going to kind of more read than riff because there's a video going here. <laughs> um, and I wanted to start by saying that, um, that I've come in a roundabout way to reporting on surveillance and privacy in the United States. For much of my professional career, I was a war correspondent. I reported on wars and other troubles overseas. This has given me a particular perspective on the work that I'm currently doing. I find it reporting on surveillance and privacy in America just as exciting, actually, um, somewhat just as risky, and definitely just as important as what I had been doing overseas, covering wars and such. I think the picture of national security reporting as being under siege, kind of in relation to what I've done before, is somewhat simplistic. I think journalists like myself, like Laura Poitras, like Glenn Greenwald, and they're in a different, much higher um, level than I am on this, um, they're under siege, but they're also invigorated, and they're also more central than ever to the health of our democracy. We'll have a discussion perhaps later about that. <laughs> um, the strange thing is that national security reporting, insofar as surveillance and privacy are concerned, has actually now become kind of hot. And I know that might seem strange, but let me kind of explain why. As I think most of you here know, the Obama administration has embarked on a pretty extraordinary program of prosecution of leakers, whistleblowers, and the journalists who receive their leaks and their documents. When I say journalists, I don't just mean people from the New York Times or from Fox News or from the Associated Press. It's also citizen activists who are performing what Jay Rosen and others refer to as acts of journalism. Jim Risen, who's a New York Times reporter, faces uh, jail time. He's just appealed to the Supreme Court because he refuses to reveal a source. Um, Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald, who I wrote about, who I think most of you are familiar with. Laura lives in Berlin, Glenn lives in Rio de Janeiro, and they are not visiting the United States at this time because they fear that if they do so, they might be subpoenaed, they might be prosecuted, they might be put into jail. So this is all kind of depressing in a sense, but journalists in a way are the canaries in the coal mine. They're the first targets, or among the first targets, of the government in its efforts to keep a hold on secrets that it doesn't want the rest of us knowing about. In a way, this is actually kind of useful, and, and bear with me as I try to explain this. Um, it's useful because it means that the media is covering the surveillance state with greater vigor than if it were not itself a target of the surveillance state. And thanks to Edward Snowden and the future Edward Snowdens, who I hope will emerge from other government agencies and from corporations like Google and Facebook, we now, when I say we, I mean journalists, ones who are focusing on surveillance and privacy, have a heck of a lot more to report on. And the atmosphere as well of media and government relations on this subject is a lot more adversarial than it has been for the last decade, and that's a very good thing. 
There's a new ecosystem, and this is a positive thing as well, that has developed where journalists who are not part of the quote unquote mainstream, whatever the hell that means now, I have no idea anymore, um, where journalists who are not part of the mainstream, and let's say Laura and Glenn are, are in that category, are now able not only to attract the news, to make the news, but they're also able to kind of lead the way and direct the reporting that mainstream institutions then follow up and engage in themselves. Laura's an example of this new ecosystem, and she's an example, and this is kind of a weird silver lining in a sense, of how the government's crackdown on the press in some ways, not in all ways, is backfiring. So Laura, she was one of the first canaries kind of lowered into this coal mine of surveillance and harassment. As some of you might know, she was a documentarian who went to Iraq in 2004 to make a film about the American occupation. The film she made, which is called My Country, My Country, which I hope everybody here sees, as well as her follow-up film, which is called The Oath. My Country, My Country was nominated for an Academy Award, and Laura herself was awarded a MacArthur Genius Fellowship a couple of years ago. She's an extraordinary and extraordinarily talented documentarian and journalist. Somehow, she was placed on a government terrorist watch list as a result of her work in Iraq. She doesn't know why. This is one of the most Orwellian, and I hate to use the word Orwellian because it is overused and I won't use it again tonight. Um, this is one of the most Orwellian, I just did again, um, <laughs> things about the surveillance state. You're placed on a watch list and you don't know why, you are not told why, you don't even know whom to ask to find out the reason you got on that watch list or how to get off of it. This is the opposite of due process. It's one of the most un-American things I can imagine. In 2006, an ordeal began in which Laura was stopped at airports and taken aside and questioned by border agents about where she had been, who she had seen. Her notebooks, cell phones, and computers were subject to search and confiscation, which she resisted mostly successfully. Sometimes the questioning lasted for hours. Now, I'm going to be talking more about Laura here, but let's just remember this happens to thousands of Americans at least every year. The numbers aren't even clear yet. I don't trust the ones that the government has kind of been forced to, to give up in a preliminary way so far. It was only in 2012 when she was questioned and told that she couldn't take notes because her pen was a weapon. This is actually what she was told by customs agents when she was trying to write down what they were asking her and what their names were, that she decided she had, had more than she could take. Glenn Greenwald, who was a friend of hers and who wrote, wrote at the time for Salon, wanted to write a story about what had been happening to her and she said, okay, now you can do it. And he did. This was in 2012. Edward Snowden reached out to Laura Poitras in January of this year because he had read about her problems with government surveillance and he knew that she was working on a film about it. This is one of the most delicious and important blowbacks of what the government was doing to Laura. Because she was under surveillance, she had become known to people like Snowden as a journalist who was sympathetic to their ideas and to what they wanted to accomplish. And also because she had been under surveillance by the government, she had developed a high level of skill in encryption technologies. And this is why she was able to conduct a surveillance resistant correspondence with Snowden that led to him leaking thousands of NSA documents to her. Being under surveillance for a journalist is a bit like being a criminal in jail, where you learn even better ways to do the things that got you in trouble in the first place. <laughs> surveillance turns us into practitioners of surveillance, of anti-surveillance technologies. I don't think the government is only scaring journalists. I mean, it is, it is scaring journalists. Um, but it's also doing something else. It's hardening us. It's giving us more incentive to do our job better to go after the secrets and the things that the government really doesn't want us to go after. And yes, it's forcing us to go to greater extremes in terms of how we do it, in terms of using encryption, and also in terms, sometimes, of not using any technology at all. And let me give you an example of that. While I was reporting my story on Poitras and Snowden, um, and this was in June and July, I went down to Rio, uh, Rio de Janeiro to meet with Laura and Glenn. Glenn lives in Rio and Laura was there visiting him and this was several weeks after they had uh, begun publishing the documents that Snowden had given them. Um, while I was reporting my story on, Snowden, on Poitras and Snowden, I was able to ask Snowden some questions encrypted through Laura. 
I sent my questions to Laura using encryption technology and using anonymizing software. And she then did the same, sending them to Snowden. And then he sent his responses, encrypted anonymizing technology, and probably even more than that, I think, back to her, and then she then sent them back to me. So we were able, as far as we could tell, to have a pretty interesting conversation without, as far as we know, the government knowing about it. Now, then it kind of flipped, because when I got these responses from Snowden, um, he was still in Sheremetyevo Airport. Remember, after Hong Kong, when he gave uh, a lot of this, these documents to Snowden and Poitras, to, to Poitras and Greenwald, he then went to Moscow and was stuck in Sheremetyevo Airport for a couple of weeks before he was granted asylum in Russia. And he wanted to gain asylum before actually these things were published, and so I had an embargo where I couldn't publish his responses until he had asylum and was safe. But what this also meant, however, was that I couldn't really email uh, these, these uh, uh, responses to my editors because they didn't use the ones that I was working with and the magazine at the time didn't use encryption. And the really kind of interesting thing about what Snowden has, uh, one of the main interesting things about what Snowden has disclosed is that if you are a national security journalist now, um, when you email something, you are publishing it. You're not publishing it to the public, but you're publishing it to the NSA and any other government agency and any other uh, entity, corporate or whatever, that is surveying you. So instead of emailing this kind of, you know, hot off the presses uh, uh, transcript and interview with, with Snowden to my editors, I went down to the newsroom, I had printed out a copy, I worked from home, um, put, printed out a hard copy, put a copy on a thumb drive, went to my editors and said, okay, guess what I got? Here's a hard copy, here's a thumb drive. Share it amongst yourselves on the hard copy, share it amongst yourselves on the thumb drive, do not email it to each other, because then it gets out, and we can't let it get out. And they did that. And this was you know, awkward and, and all that, but it was one of the ways that we were able to kind of you know, have a degree of security using both encryption and no technology whatsoever in the correspondence that we got from Snowden. Um, it's, it's one of the, I was, I was a student in the Soviet Union in 1980, and there was a, telephone in the lobby of the dormitory that I was living in that everybody knew you don't use because it was bugged. And you knew not to use any of the telephones that were within easy walking distance of the dormitory either because they were bugged. So you went out of your way to find a telephone to call your Russian friends on. Or you just you know, arranged to meet them and didn't make any changes and you met them in uh, whatever place you would agree to meet them. The idea now that because the government is listening to us, the NSA is listening to us, that therefore we can't do our job, it's just wrong. It makes it more difficult. But journalists like myself have been doing their reporting long before cell phones, long before Facebook and all that. And so now we kind of return to it in some ways. I was contacted about a month ago by somebody who had some interesting information to tell me about America and Iraq. And I talked to this person on a landline and I didn't call his number directly. And we agreed, I told them, look, I, I, I really need to see this stuff, but um, don't email it to me. Print it out, put it in an envelope, and mail it to me, and I gave them my home address. Now, you know, the government can kind of look at my mail, but it, it requires a degree of judicial involvement that's uncomfortable, that is a lot more difficult for the government to get and uh, than just kind of checking my email. Um, now, there's a kind of you know, sad punchline to this story in the sense of I still haven't received those documents. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, but, and, and maybe this person was put off by kind of the realization that you know, it's, it's, it's serious business these days to, to provide information to journalists, even if it's not classified information. But it can be done. In any event, um, I just want to wrap up by saying <clears throat> I'm not optimistic about the prospects for a surveillance-free future for you and me, but I am optimistic about the prospects for good journalism about the surveillance. I hope that kind of this is a Woodward and Bernstein moment for us in the sense of a new generation of reporters being inspired by people like Glenn and Laura and what they've done. And I think that for some young journalists or young journalists to be, maybe some who are here, these people like Greenwald, like Poitras, and like Snowden, this is for kind of the leakers and whistleblowers of the future. Uh, these are models that will be followed. 
It's a scary time to report on government surveillance in some respects, but it's also an exciting time to do so. And because let's remember, good reporting has always been risky. War reporters, American war reporters, have been risking their lives for you know, generations. So it's not such a big deal that national security reporters now are maybe taking more risks than they did in the past. And it pales also in comparison to the risks that journalists in places like Russia, Syria, Iraq, we can go on, are taking every day. They can get killed for stepping over the line. We can maybe get a subpoena or perhaps threatened with jail. So there's a lot more to talk about, but I'll just hand it over right now, I think, to Ayal. Thank you. Um, thank you, Peter. Uh, and if, for those of you who, who I'm sure many of you have, but if you haven't read Peter's great piece in the New York Times Magazine, please do so, because uh, it's just a, a model piece of, of storytelling and, and also gripping and important journalism. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk less about surveillance, um, since I know far less about it than the other panelists here, um, and, and, and less about um, the specific revelations that Snowden made uh, than about uh, what the debate about Snowden has revealed about all of us, about um, uh, us as a, as a, as a society, uh, about the way we think about um, individual dissenters and about whistleblowers, um, which I wrote a book about that was published last year. Um, now, if you recall, when, when, Snowden, when the Snowden story broke um, in, in Washington, in particular in Washington, uh, on shows like Meet the Press uh, and, and elsewhere, um, Snowden actually was not uh, regarded or, or allowed to be granted um, the label whistleblower, uh, specifically Dianne Feinstein, um, Senator Dianne Feinstein, uh, said, I don't look at this as being a whistleblower. Uh, Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, um, tweeted, why is media using sympathetic word whistleblower for Edward Snowden? Um, and one answer to Haas's question is that the media, much of the media, actually was not using the term whistleblower, um, and specifically not using it because uh, the uh, standards editor for the Associated Press wrote a memo sp uh, addressing this very question. What should we call Edward Snowden? We being journalists, uh, members of uh, the press and the media and, and in institutions in the press. Um, and that memo said uh, we should refer to Snowden as a leaker, not as a whistleblower. Um, now leaker, it so happens, is the term that the Obama administration has used for all of the seven now officials, uh, six officials, uh, s someone just held up eight, um, officials who uh, it has prosecuted um, for violating the Espionage Act for disclosing um, classified information. Um, all of them in the administration's eyes are leakers and unauthorized leakers, um, and it has been very reluctant to grant any of them the term, uh, the label, whistleblower. Um, so let's look a little bit at the Associated Press's logic. Why not, why, is, why was Edward Snowden not a whistleblower? Um, well, the first thing the, that AP Standards memo said was that um, a whistleblower is someone who exposes wrongdoing. It is not someone who simply asserts what he or she believes is wrongdoing, okay? So you expose wrongdoing, you don't simply assert something that you believe is wrong and, exp and expose that. Um, now, it's true if you assert wrongdoing, official wrongdoing or corporate wrongdoing, um, with no real basis of evidence, just as sort of conjecture, then I think we can all agree you don't, you don't belong in the category whistleblower. You shouldn't be called a whistleblower. You're just sort of saying this is an act of, you're, you're, you're shouting fire, uh, but, but there's, there's no there there. Um, but what if you reasonably believe that what you are exposing, even if it is classified, what if you reasonably believe that that is wrongdoing and or illegal 
unconstitutional. Well, in that case, you are a whistleblower. And that's by the government's own definition. If you reasonably believe you are exposing an act of illegality or unconstitutional wrongdoing, you are a whistleblower. That's in a lot of the statutes protecting whistleblowers from reprisal. Um, that's also the definition of whistleblowers that is used by the Government Accountability Project, the oldest and probably most renowned um, organization that defends the rights of whistleblowers in court. Um, and indeed, uh, Lewis Clark, the head of the Government Accountability Project, didn't, didn't actually know about this AP memo, uh, but I wrote a story about um, the memo and sort of the debate about what to call uh, Snowden. Um, for the New York Review of Books blog, and I, and I called him and said, what do you think of this memo? He read the memo and he said, that's exactly wrong. What they're, what, what they're saying a leaker is, they're, they're basically using the government's term uh, instead of what is, in this case, to him, was, was a sort of cut and dried, clear cut case of whistleblowing. This is sort of the standard act of whistleblowing, what, what Snowden did in his eyes. Um, now, what, there was more to the AP memo. Um, not just that, that first point. There was a second point. That memo said, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't as, as journalists, rush ahead and call Snowden, or for that matter, Bradley Manning, um, a whistleblower, because what they were blowing the whistle on was hotly contested. That's the exact quote. So in other words, if they had blown the whistle on something that was not hotly contested, but rather something that we all agreed was wrong, we could call them whistleblowers. The only problem with that is that if we use that standard for particularly for officials in the national security arena, then there are no whistleblowers in US history, including Daniel Ellsberg, um, who is kind of regarded today as the sort of prototypical national security whistleblower. He leaked the Pentagon Papers, and you know, I don't think you, you hear a lot of dispute and debate about whether Ellsberg deserves to be called a whistleblower for doing that. Now, at the time that Ellsberg did that, was that a consensus idea? It's a good thing to, to expose the Pentagon Papers because they expose lies about the Vietnam War? Of course not. Uh, in fact, if you go back and read uh, a wonderful essay that Taylor Branch wrote um, in, in, I think, the first book uh, published with the title Whistleblower in it, it was called The Whistleblowers, and it was edited by Taylor Branch and Charles Peters. And, um, he wrote specifically about Ellsberg, and he quoted his dovish friends, the, the doves, not the hawks, on the Vietnam War, who, who knew Ellsberg and said, our friend Dan has gone crazy. They thought he was insane for doing this. Um, and it turns out the debate about Ellsberg's act at the time was very similar in ways to the debate we had about Snowden now. Um, so um, again, if, 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 we, if we look for um, wrongdoing that's not hotly contested, we're not gonna have a lot of whistleblowers out there. In fact, think, think of someone, think, imagine an official, and this has actually happened, of course, it happened during the Bush era. Imagine an official who leaks um, what they think is um, skewed or um, uh, twisted reports about climate change. Um, there actually was a whistleblower who did that. Well, the underlying wrongdoing in that case is hotly contested. Some people think that the studies the Bush administration was trying to change or suppress were um, junk science and were not, that, that, that climate change really isn't happening. So if, if we're looking for consensus uh, and, and, and whistleblowers, again, we're not gonna find any. Now, the real reason to give um, Senator Feinstein and others um, some, some, some credit. You know, the, the, the real reason I think they didn't want people to think of Edward Snowden as a whistleblower is because they thought, I think wrongly, they thought that if he, if he is given that label, um, he becomes a hero in the eyes of the public. He becomes a kind of um, truth teller, um, a muckraker from the inside. That's what um, Taylor Branch used, that sort of evocative image to, to describe what a whistleblower does. Someone who sort of bravely takes on the institution, uh, defies authority, defies the boss, defies the government, um, and that of course we have this kind of Thoreauvian tradition in, this, in, this, in our society. We think of people, of individuals who go up against corrupt authority as heroic figures. Um, it's true that we have that strand in our culture, 
Um, it's true that a lot of us read Thoreau when we were in high school. Um, and it's true that I think of all the forms of dissent out there, Americans are most prone to um, regarding these kinds of individuals, these disgruntled insiders who witness corruption and then report it, as, as admirable. I think you're much likely to be regarded as admirable if you fall into that category than, say, if you belong to some dissenting group that takes to the streets and um, you know, wants to break apart the two-party system or something like that. Um, however, in reality, and this is why I think um, Feinstein, in a sense, could have spared herself the trouble. She shouldn't have been too worried. In reality, what Americans feel about people like Snowden, um, and people like Ellsberg, and people like Manning, um, is deeply, deeply conflicted. Um, there is not this rush to um, celebrate, honor, and, um, and uh, thank them for, for, for what uh, they've done. Uh, to the contrary, there, there is um, you know, a whole other strand in our culture that has, has been exposed in, if you look at the surveys that have been done um, by international survey organizations that specifically want to find out how do Americans compare to people in other countries when it comes to questions like, um, should a person support their country even if it is in the wrong? Should a person support their country, even if it is in the wrong? And in a survey I cite in my book, uh, I think there were 11 countries, um, the US came in first in that. More, more Americans said, yes, a person should support their country, even if it is in the wrong, than in those other 10 countries, whatever number there were in the other country. Um, now, what about the question, right or wrong, should be a matter of personal conscience, kind of the Thoreauvian idea. Same question, same poll. U.S. came in next to last in that. Um, how about whether you should be, uh, you should defy your boss or defer to your boss? How about whether you should defy the church or defer to the church? In all of these categories, Americans come out pretty close to the bottom, um, which shows you, I think, that Alexis de Tocqueville and many, many other observers of this country were correct when they detected a, a very powerful strand of conformity, of kind of go along and get along. Um, there's a third objection to thinking of Snowden and also Manning, but particularly Snowden, um, as, as a whistleblower. Um, and that is the nature of the act. The fact that, as Peter described, he took his information to a journalist. He did not take his information to his superiors. And you heard some people say, um, including some members of Congress, well, look, we have channels in this country for people in institutions and government agencies who don't, who think something illegal is being done. They can go to these channels, right? They can come before Congress. They can uh, consult their superiors. They can uh, write memos and, and, and so forth. Um, the only problem with that is, well, there are two problems. First of all, there is actually no agreement among those who study whistleblowers and defend them in court that you are obligated to go to your superiors. In fact, if you have a clear or, or pretty reasonable idea that going to your superiors <clears throat> is going to get you fired and silenced, then what groups like the Government Accountability Project tell you to do is don't go to your superior. Because if you think you have something that's in the public interest, it will never get out. And the only thing that will happen is that you will be fired or your career will be destroyed. What about the NSA in that regard? And this is the second problem. Well, there were NSA whistleblowers before Edward Snowden. Um, Tom Drake is one of them. You may, I'm seeing some nods so people know his story. If you don't and you're curious to know what happened to him, um, read Jane Mayer's story, The Secret Sharer, which I think was published in 2011. Basically, Drake exhausted every internal channel there is, got nowhere, then went to a reporter at the Baltimore Sun, and for all of this, had his career destroyed and was accused of espionage, I think 10 counts of espionage. The counts were eventually dropped, but his career as a government official was basically destroyed. Um, and William Binney, another NSA whistleblower, 
actually told USA Today after Snowden came forward, while not agreeing with everything about what Snowden did and the way he did it, he said, you know, I think he's, he watched what happened to us. That's why he did what he did. So I think that, that third, um, you know, he should have gone internally rather than to the press, I, I don't think is valid. Um, having said everything I've said, you can tell I do, I do think that Edward Snowden merits being called a whistleblower. Um, is he a typical whistleblower? Um, that's another, that's a sort of separate question. And I'll wrap up very quickly on that point. Um, he is typical, I think, in some ways. I haven't met him, I haven't interviewed him, I haven't asked him encrypted questions. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that much about the, the internal sort of motivations, but everything, everything about his biography suggests that he was not someone who was looking to rebel, um, that rather he, um, he had a certain streak of idealism, he wanted to uh, fight in the Iraq war. Um, that's typical of whistleblowers. They tend to be these sort of disillusioned idealists, people who were very by the book and believed in the principles and the rules until they saw them being violated and then kind of turned. I think the way he's not typical is actually exemplified by this discussion tonight. His voice was heard. He managed to spark a pretty extraordinary debate. Um, and in my book, I have a much darker story about a couple of American whistleblowers who did very courageous things, had their careers destroyed, and were completely and utterly silenced or ignored. So in that sense, um, I think his story is, is a kind of invigorating one. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and then I'm going to throw it open to the audience. So I want to circle back to something that Carrie was getting at at the end of her presentation, which is, so who decides what's in the public interest? Um, do individuals who come across wrongdoing or what they perceive to be wrongdoing, whether it's um, systematic of the type that we're talking about here, whether they're individual acts of wrongdoing, who gets to decide that it's okay to expose the government's secrets? And some of these were probably legitimate secrets, maybe not all, but at least some piece of what uh, has been revealed could be classified as secret. Why should an individual get to decide that? So I'm gonna throw that down to that end of the, the table. Oh, I'll gladly answer that one. Um, I very respectfully you know, um, disagree with some of the things that Carrie said, as she would probably expect. And I, I respect what she says, and it's a really important argument and debate. I think it's a really messy process who gets to decide. If it's just the government that gets to decide, we know that's an incredibly imperfect, um, problematic process. Oversight has, you know, through generations, been very problematic and inadequate as the current NSA situation shows. So what is the counterbalance to government over oversight in the sense of when it fails? Well, it is whistleblowers, leakers, and journalists. Glenn Greenwald, I don't think, pretends to have a monopoly on deciding what is in the public interest. I don't think Glenn should have a monopoly. I don't think any individual should have a monopoly. Glenn has worked with editors and has worked with other reporters who are very experienced, as is he, and they've been actually incredibly judicious about what they have disclosed. They have thousands and thousands of top secret government documents, and they have written stories so far that I believe relate to or quote from just a couple hundred. It is a messy process. It's not perfect that journalists who have not necessarily lifelong education in the fields that they are working on deciding what should be published, who don't know necessarily everything that's happening out in the field in terms of enemy actions, enemy intent. But they've acted very responsibly, and when they act responsibly, I think they're an important part of this process that we are at a, you know, kind of grievous loss if we don't have it. They are, I met with Omidyar, the backer of this new venture, uh, about a month ago, and he said something to me that was really good. Um, we were talking about Greenwald and leakers and whistleblowers, and he said, you know, they're not a bug. They're a feature of democracy. They're not a bug of democracy. 
And so I think that the role that they play, that they have played, is absolutely essential. Bill, do you want to add something? Um, <coughs> I, I guess uh, just I, I do want to say that um, to the extent that, that uh, whistleblowers are simply following what their individual conscience tells them is right, um, that obviously is not a warrant in and of itself to, to um, disclose anything or, or necessarily to, um, uh, to claim being, acting in the public interest. I mean, the, 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 an act of conscience has to be judged on the basis of, of the issues that it draws attention to, not just on the fact that the individual happened to be passionately committed to that particular position. Because if that's the case, then everybody can just do whatever they want and disclose whatever they want and say whatever they want um, with no regard for um, what the rest of uh, society will suffer as a consequence. That said, I think that in um, uh, Snowden's case, and I think that the polling on this is really, really interesting, um, in spite of what I just said about surveys of Americans, I've been really struck mm -hmm. at the majorities who believe that what Snowden disclosed was a matter of public interest and is a matter of public interest, particularly strong majorities granted among younger people. Um, there's a big age gra gap on, in, in, that, in those surveys. But it's pretty striking that, um, that there's such a, a, a response. And I think there's a lesson in that, which is that whistleblowers really don't matter unless the rest of, the, unless the rest of society pays attention and hears what they're saying. If you don't, the uh, freedom to dissent and the freedom to speak and the, and the freedom to not be jailed for this kind of thing um, is, is utterly meaningless because you, you, you speak and, and no one hears you, so nothing changes. Um, now, for this end of the table, I have a slightly different question. Um, the law and technology, we've sort of gone back and forth on this a little bit, and, and Carrie, you, you pointed out that under a, an old Supreme Court case which held that a pen register, which registers the phone numbers called and the duration of a call from a single telephone uh, is the basis for collecting all of the phone call records of all Americans over a seven year period of time. Seems a bit of a stretch, but let's just assume it, it applies for the moment. Um, do you think that the law has kept up with technology? Do you think, you know, based on some of the discussions we've had today, that metadata really shouldn't be protected under the Fourth Amendment, given the amount of information that it can reveal about individuals? What do you think, from your perspective, Dana? I mean, do you see any progression in how we are thinking about these things in the policy debates that's taking account of the kind of technological advancements you're looking at on a daily basis? Okay, so. I'll start first. And then, um, okay, so a couple thoughts. So first of all, law is notoriously out of date with technology. I mean, there's all sorts of um, our electronic communications laws, not just FISA, but there's all sorts of laws that um, that are well recognized to technology moves faster than law and moves faster than the legislative process. And so at a very general level, I think, I think many people would agree that that frequently is the case and it doesn't keep up. Um, with respect though to the 215 program, the telephony metadata program in particular that we're talking about, I think it's important to draw distinctions between the, um, the general types of things that Dana is talking about with respect to the power of metadata. And I certainly wouldn't, don't, don't challenge what she's describing in terms of the potential for learning information um, through metadata. What though is important to distinguish about this particular 215 program is the restrictions and limits which the government put and the court approved on it for the use of it. So in this specific program, the NSA is not mapping all of the data that's obtaining from the metadata program. There are very, very specific, only counterterrorism purposes, only 22 people who can approve the searches that are, or the, the queries that are done into the data, um, only certain levels of sort of connections that can be made, certain numbers of connections that can be made after the initial query of the data, all in an extremely restricted way. And what the FISA court has said is that without all of those rules and restrictions that are part of the court order, the court would not have approved the collection. 
So in this circumstance, um, certainly I think there's a, there's a bigger concept of metadata, metadata um, generally, but it's important to distinguish how the potential for using that type of information um, has been significantly restricted in this 215 program in particular. So can I, can I just ask you one quick follow-up question? But that restriction was also violated, right? I mean, there is evidence out there, there are documents out there, um, a, a court opinion, which shows that the NSA wasn't just using it for the purposes that it was allowed to use it for, that in fact they were running uh, watch lists against this data as it came in every day. So it, it's not quite as clean as all of that, is it? And then I just want to add one more twist and I want to, you to respond, which is this is the piece that we know about, right? We know about telephony metadata. We also know that the government had a program to collect internet metadata, whatever that may be, uh, at some point in time that was ended, they say, in 2011. We don't know what other information the government is gathering and putting together with this metadata. So is it really fair to kind of look at this program just completely in isolation like that? Uh, well, to answer, so I'll, I'll try to break those down. Um, I'm not aware of suggestions that uh, that the government has used the information for anything other than counterterrorism purposes. So as far as I know, um, they, the, what has been revealed has only indicated that um, even with respect, I think you're referring to the alert list, mm -hmm. which was um, discussed in one of the, uh, the lengthy court opinions that was very critical from the FISA court of the government. Um, it still has only been used for counterterrorism purposes. That being said, the particular um, uh, event that I think you're referring to was a compliance matter. and. In these type, in, in surveillance systems, there are going to be compliance matters. There just will. And in fact, compliance matters were contemplated by the FISA statute because it's written into law that whenever there are compliance matters, they have to be reported to Congress and the intelligence oversight committees. So granted, the public didn't know about these compliance matters, but Congress did. And, and that sort of actually brings us back to, I think, the, a, a point that Peter made earlier when he was talking about the public interest point, um, and then I'll turn it over to Dana to respond to your original question. But in the discussion of, of sort of who decides the public interest, I think um, Peter sort of said, okay, well, it can't just be the government. Now, I think what people think about when they're talking about that is the executive branch. It shouldn't just be the executive branch that decides. And so then, then we go to sort of the whistleblowers and the reporters. There's an important piece in the middle here, and that is, well, two, there's the courts, and then there's Congress. And so I think that that reporting piece, when we talk about, well, we didn't know what was going on, there is a established framework that was sort of the, the, the agreement that was developed in the late 1970s through a system of intelligence committees in Congress, recognizing that national security collection activities need to occur in secret, but that there still needs to be some accountability to the people and that that would occur through their elected representatives. And so while, for example, these compliance matters weren't known to the public, they were known to Congress. And so I think part of the conversation that seems to be evolving is do Americans still have confidence in that uh, uh, agreement that was developed, which was something in between public disclosure and only the executive branch knowing, going, knowing, on, knowing what was going on. And that piece in the middle is the important piece of congressional oversight. So um, first, coming back to the question that you asked about, you know, to what degree are people more aware of what's going on and how that plays out? I actually think this is where journalism and the role of Snowden have been really, really interesting. Um, so I think that Snowden, in many ways, looked at Chelsea Manning and looked at what was actually unfolding around that and learned a lot from this process. The result of which is that the, the way in which we saw this unfold was that um, Snowden played a game of where's Waldo um, to really, it, on an international level, which in many ways allowed the journalists to catch up. It gave time 
for people to actually start covering this story and making sense of it. And this is actually where we started to see the public pay attention in different ways. Because at first, no one understood why this was a story, why should they should pay attention. And a lot of the technology community was saying, like, we're finally getting to see this, and we're trying to ramp it up. And certainly, you saw folks like the EFF or CDT really try to spark this. But it was, in many ways, a, a, a process of the technology community trying to inform the journalists, the journalists trying to catch up to what, what this meant technically, um, that actually ended up moving things forward. And I think that you know your point about like suddenly understanding crypto because you need to figure it out is really really key here. I think that you know amidst all of this is this question um, you know to Carrie's claims about um, about representative government. I think that one of the challenges is that people are not actually just frustrated with the executive branch. I think that there's a complete uh, sort of disgust, um, and I'm sure the last month did not help, um, with how our congressional representatives are actually participating in this as a set of oversight. And I think that it's not surprising that we're seeing a, a, a disagreement amongst youth versus um, older populations. I think they're seeing a lot of young people who feel as though there is not a meaningful check check to power in a really critical way. And so this is where I actually think that you're seeing these moves happen simultaneously. Now, for me, one of, you know, with my other hat on, I spent a lot of time spent, uh, with young people, with teenagers and 20-somethings. And I've been watching the dynamics around 4chan for quite some time at this point. And I think that there's another thing that's sort of emerging in all of this, which is a group of technically savvy young people who are looking, and at first were really using their technology to challenge um, the control of the media and to really be a check to the level of media coverage of things and really to play with media. Um, and I thought, you know, we used to talk about it as hacking the attention economy, mm -hmm. um, which was sort of a fun way of saying, like, can you get Oprah to say something stupid? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, and then we saw this sophistication of trying to understand things. And this is where I think that as these things have unfolded, first as you know, Anonymous with a capital A came into existence in light of what was happening with WikiLeaks, in light of what was happening with Chelsea Manning, and even more so, I think that we're starting to see that whistleblowing is becoming a civil disobedience of this age. And I think this is where we're going to see a huge dissent amongst young people, and especially in light of some of the points that Carrie's raising, because what the government has raised, or what are the assumptions of the government and the way that it's architected, don't feel right for many people coming of age in this era that is entirely networked, that has a whole new global phenomenon, and has a whole set of different technological logics that the current government infrastructure is not in a position to actually make sense of. Thank you. Um, we're going to open it up to the floor now. So um, there are going to be a couple of people uh, going around with mics. We have a large audience and a limited amount of time, so I'm really going to ask everybody to please uh, keep your remarks as brief as you can. We have a two-minute uh, timeline uh, on all questions, and um, we will be taking three questions at a time in order to make it go faster. So we can start up here in the front. There are two, and then we'll move further back in a minute. Hope not. <laughs> Hang on. Just get the three in the front, and then we'll move further back. Um, yes. Uh, I want to thank you, Carrie, for being so precise about what the law actually is, because we conversationally blend it with what's right and wrong versus what is legal and how our government works. But what I do see is an enormous lack of faith in the process of government and even in, in our Constitution. Sorry, there's this one right here in the middle. To Gary, um, I'm a journalist from Brazil actually, and you've mentioned that uh, there is no information that, that you know that um, the programs are using to uh, counter terrorism. You have no information about that, but we have information in Brazil and other countries that they're using the program to spy and purpose, like for example, the mail of my president was being hacked, and Mexican candidates also, 
and there is the problem with the diplomats in France. And that is these informations are available this week, for example. So I want you to comment about it. Okay, so why don't we take that cluster of three? So, um, so just the first two. Um, one, is it going to be illegal to use crypto? I mean, I hope not. I think the bigger challenge is to what degree are the very structures of crypto going to be destabilized? Um, and what are the implications of this? Um, and of course, you know, this is a research question. There are researchers in this, in this, in this school as well as around the uh, globe trying to figure out different aspects of crypto. And I think there's a lot of different kind of innovation we'll see there. So hopefully it will not become illegal, but there's other questions there. In terms of the shift of computing, one of the, I would say we're actually at the beginning of a really important shift. For the last 30 years, we saw the rise of what we now think of as the internet, right? And the, all of the architectures that uh, enabled connectivity in a really significant way. We're actually, be, um, at, again, at the precipice of another shift. And I would say it's a shift around data. Um, and it's horribly called the big data phenomenon. And I don't even want to get into how that has nothing to do with bigness or data. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, is that what we're seeing is that, is that moment of realizing that we can do a lot of different kind of computational shifts. And I think it's important to realize that this is happening at the same time we're seeing a shift from logics uh, uh, organized around group structures to logic of networks. And so for those who aren't familiar with some of the database technologies that are happening, as we start to move to NoSQL databases, which are part of the desire to collect any and all data and to slurp it up and figure it out later, part of it is that the logic of how you work through that data looks very differently. Now, the reason I bring this up is that I don't think that the majority of people understand what the shift in data and the ways of doing data analysis and the kinds of things that will happen are, and this is where I rely heavily on journalists to start telling these stories and to start figuring out you know, where this is playing out in the market, where this is playing out in human rights, where this is playing out in governance, because we're going to see these transformations across all sectors in really important ways. But I think that we're only at the beginning of figuring out how they will play out, and I think that shift in computing will be as significant as the shift that we've seen around the creation of the internet. Carrie? Sure. So to respond, thank you for the question from the uh, Brazilian journalist. I'm happy to clarify rem my uh, remarks. When I was talking about programs, uh, the, the program that only is with respect to counterterrorism, I was speaking specifically about the what we call the 215 telephone metadata program, which is the, what has been revealed as the collection of metadata of US phone numbers. So that is a program that is only for counterterrorism purposes, as, uh, according to the, the documents that the government has released. That is different than what has been discussed as either the 702 program, which is section 702 of the FISA, amend 702 of FISA, but it's the FISA Amendments Act of 2008, which enables foreign intelligence collection, which can include counterterrorism, but also is a broader definition of foreign intelligence information, and which um, is geared towards targeting non-US persons non-US persons reasonably believed to be outside of the United States. So those are two different types of programs, one narrowly targeted, one that is respect to foreign intelligence information. NSA is a signals intelligence agency. It collects foreign intelligence information that's relevant to the United States' national security and foreign affairs. Um, an important point to make, though, that has sort of uh, come out in, in some of the that I think is relevant to the discussion is that the intelligence community doesn't exist to serve itself. The intelligence community exists to serve policymakers, and the president is the number one policymaker. And so it's important in terms of um, thinking about the information that has come out recently is that the intelligence community isn't sort of tasking itself and, and serving its own mission. It exists to support policymakers so that they can make informed decisions in order to best protect America's national security and foreign affairs conduct. So uh, we're going to go up towards the back for a bit, and we'll take three questions. Thanks a lot. A terrific conversation. Um, you were talking about the role of the courts, but is anybody who ever tried to sue a federal judge for fraud knows uh, judges have the right to be, quote unquote, corrupt or malicious in the decision making. In other words, the decision making is totally arbitrary and what we call due process of the law is in essence a legalized swindle. It's very, very hard to describe it any other way. And the large problem is 
that the press doesn't want to look at judiciary at all, at how they arrive at, the, at their decision. So I would think that the large portion of the problem that we're having lies at the feet of the press and the various public centers for justice or whatever they're called, for not looking at how judges operate, for leaving this huge black spot, black spot or, um, you know, <clears throat> leaving it completely up to judges to do their thing. And of course, you know, power corrupts absolute, power corrupts absolutely, to the point where they publicly say through the case law that we have the right to be corrupt and malicious. And that seems to be very much the problem and the root of great many problems that we're having, it seems to me. Can you go for the back? <coughs> well, okay, th uh, th uh, thank you. Um, the discussion today has been fairly narrow in its scope in terms of how we define surveillance, and you focus solely on the NSA. I'm interested in the extension of surveillance beyond the NSA and how the, the whole society is being watched. So I would like to, I'm curious to see where you see the extensions of laws to protect not only the sharing of information across federal agencies, but down to the state and local levels, and also across the line into the private sector, in terms of the way that all this information is being accumulated and processed and also monitorized for, for, for private gain. If I could just follow up on the question about the international perspective, which is, um, Carrie, you said that uh, um, under FISA, people outside the U.S. are not persons with constitutional protections, which is quite true, but they are persons with legal protections under international law, including the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, which includes protections for privacy and due process requirements, including individualized suspicion. Um, and of course, the U.S. is a signatory to that. So can you talk a little bit about um, the structure of international law and how the U.S. views it? Because clearly, from the international perspective, there's a great deal of outrage about this and a great deal of concern among many of the citizens of our allied countries about the attitude of the U.S. toward its international obligations. Uh, according to the announcement, the purpose of this gathering was to discuss what further boundaries we might seek to establish on uh, surveillance. And I'm wondering whether things would be different and uh, the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch might all be more up in arms if people uh, the people directly involved were a little different. I understand there's only two people in the House and two people in the Senate on the Intelligence Committees who actually receive the uh, news about secrets uh, from the intelligence agencies. And I understand that the Chief Justice is, handpicks every member of FISA, which is why there's only uh, one Democratic judge who's ever served on FISA out of 10 or 15. Um, so if people were a little different, things like the uh, presumption that if you don't know whether someone is uh, an international person and a non-U.S. citizen, then the, uh, they, there's a presumption that they are a non-U.S. citizen. Um, whether some of these points might be decided differently if different individuals were in charge and different, uh, or in office, and different um, uh, uh, initiatives might be underway. There might be more energy to set different boundaries on the surveillance. Thank you. Those are, those are all great questions. I'm actually going to take one of them myself, uh, which is surveillance across several agencies. And I think that's a really great question because we have today been focusing on the NSA because that's what's been in the news. Uh, but one of the things we've seen post 9-11 is that this individualized suspicion standard has broken down across the board. So what that means is that a lot of the compromises that were reached in the 1970s alongside the FISA court and all of that, which was that the FBI, for example, was restrained from gathering information about Americans unless it had some reason to suspect wrongdoing, has also broken down. Local police have also given up this constraint, which many of them were forced to accept uh, through consent decrees brought you know, in the wake of lawsuits uh, based on political surveillance of anti-war protesters, et cetera. So this entire idea of 
individualized suspicion, like the government's got to have some reason to watch you before it watches you, has completely broken down. Um, and, and really, the NSA, I think, is so disturbing to people because unlike, say, the NYPD, the NSA's reach is so extraordinarily large. I mean, the, the amount of data that the NSA is collecting is just exponentially greater than what the NYPD or the LAPD or anybody else could be collecting. And the other piece I think that's important to keep in mind is, for example, in a lot of these instances, the telephony metadata program, for example, the NSA is collecting that information based on FBI requests as well. So it's not just the NSA that we're talking about. This is a phenomenon that we see kind of across the board uh, today. And, you know, a lot of people will argue that this is a, the, the necessary response to 9-11 and that what we're trying to do over here is to kind of connect the dots. We failed to connect the dots and that led to 9-11 and so this is our effort to connect the dots. And I think that most people who work in these organizations really do believe that that is the mission that they're trying to fulfill. Um, but the question remains whether generating more and more information is actually the best way to achieve that protection goal. Okay, I'll try to hit on a, a few of the themes that came up um, in some of the questions and just sort of picking up from, um, from Faisal's remarks. Um, I agree that there, there uh, is a real concern when it comes to uh, so the, some of the work that you've done with respect to the uh, local law enforcement involved in foreign intelligence collection. Um, part of the reason that I wanted tonight to try to lay out some of what the oversight structures are on the federal government side is because there is not that type of parity um, when it comes to some of the, the local law enforcement um, that are getting into this area. And I think that does raise significant concerns because there are um, very significant rules that protect privacy and protect civil liberties at the federal government letter, um, at the federal government level that, um, that we don't see at the local level. With respect to the question um, about uh, sort of accommodating the, uh, the rights with respect to non-U.S. persons who uh, might be collected in the course of United States government intelligence activities. I guess just, just one point I would make on that is that, as, as far as I know, this is the only country in the world that has a FISA court and that has a judicial check on executive branch intelligence um, activities, um, certainly with the rigor that, that the FISA court um, does its business. And there are, uh, it's not just one judge, there are, um, uh, several, seven different judges who are on the court, or maybe it's nine now, 11, 11 now, <laughs> excuse me, sorry. Over the years that I was working for, the court has kept increasing. So thank you, Kripaza. Um So there's 11 now who serve what I had seven. Se generally, they serve seven year staggered terms. Um, and so there is a rotating group of judges who come in so that it's not sort of the same one or two or even three judges who are doing this business for a very long time. Um, they have staggered terms and they come in and then they rotate off the court. Um, with respect to the point on congressional oversight, um, the intelligence committees, according to the FISA statute, have to be fully informed about activities that are conducted under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. And there's nothing in the statute that limits that just to a couple members of the Intelligence Committee. The reports that are given to the committee are given to the whole committee. Um, and on the Intelligence Committee side, you know, then they also have staff members who are able to work with them on those matters. Um, some staff on the Judiciary Committees as well are able to help. But Judiciary Committees also, both on the House and Senate side, receive a significant amount of reporting on, um, on FISA activities. So maybe I want to throw it out to you guys at that end of the table to talk a little bit about this international perspective because, in fact, it's correct. Both of the things that Carrie said are correct, which is that the FISA law does not recognize any rights for non-citizen. So, you know, if you're Brazilian, sorry, you're out of luck. Um, you can spy on you for pretty much any reason we want. And that has, you know, traditionally been the rule amongst nation states. It's, you know, there is a, an argument that that's not all that different than it's al always been. Um, there was a second piece I had, but I forgot. So let's just start with that. <laughs> you, you know, f frankly, the international aspect of it doesn't really concern me as much, just because 
this is America, I'm American, this is my government, and I just think there are much clearer problems we're dealing with or need to deal with here than overseas in terms of surveillance of foreign citizens. So the question that was raised above in terms of what are the rights of foreign citizens, et cetera, that applies also to American citizens, you know, vis-a-vis -vis surveillance by other foreign governments equally. Um, and at the moment, it's somewhat of an abstract question because nobody's really focused on it. And one of the reasons they haven't focused on it, and I don't really focus on it, is because I'm just much more concerned about what the American government is doing to Americans because there are kind of clear laws and clear kind of ideas of what American, Americans are and what our rights are that I think are being violated. So I just tend to focus on that more. Um, I guess I would, uh, well, sorry. Um, not in terms of the international, um, uh, the ripple effects of what Snowden revealed, I, I thought it was interesting that, um, not surprisingly, uh, he became an instant hero in other countries. Um, and I don't think that's a great credit to those countries because uh, the fact is um, it's easy to love a whistleblower or a, a, a person who dissents against someone else's government, particularly when that government is the United States. Um, you know, the, the hard thing always in every society, I think, is to... Um, is, is, is when the, the uh, government is your own, when the beliefs being dissented against are the ones you share. Um, so I don't know if that directly I, I addresses. I a specific question on this. Can we really tell when data is international or foreign or American? <laughs> Sorry. And the answer is it depends. I mean, it's a question of whether or not you're actually trying to determine, uh, you know, is the person behind the data international or American? Is the IP address? I mean, that's actually a little bit more clear, but not always. Um, is, you know, the conversation between multiple actors, can we break down those, diff what is, what's content for which actor? Which becomes more complicated because a lot of what we're dealing with is communication and what happens when one of the actors is foreign and one of the actors is domestic. And I think that this, this gets really messy. And I think this is actually one of the reasons why we see, you know, the 51% uh, test is actually results in just Tell pretty. Us about the 51%. Oh, the idea that if there's a 51% probability that this is a foreign actor or that the conversation includes a foreign actor, you, it's amazing how much you could actually sweep up under that in terms of um, fluidity of what that data actually looks like, especially as it passes through different uh, networks. Um, I just want to also sort of say one thing about the international issue, which is that we can talk about the international issue as it relates to um, individuals and the, the rights um, and due process of individuals around the globe. But there's another issue at play here, which is that we're increasingly living in a global society where there's especially a global um, kinds of network data. And what this means, and one of the things we're seeing very starkly to be true, is that this is undermining any trust in American business to be able to operate, you know, in a way that connects with foreign nationals at all. So the thing is, is you know, and the Brazilian government, I think, is taking an interesting lead in all of this, is saying, wait a minute, why are we using foreign um, servers to hold our data? Why are we allowing our citizens to um, use foreign email systems? What are the implications of this? And I think that that's where we can talk about this as a, as a governance issue within our, our um, Society, but we can also talk about it within within an economic structure because I think that the implications of saying that you know any time that a server is hosted or connected to an American company that that data is under American law, especially if we're talking about international citizens, that's where things get messy. And this is actually where, to your point, it's like if you're a Brazilian citizen and you're using one of the major you know uh, you know email servers that are owned by an American company, the probability that your email goes through an American network is extraordinarily high. And that's actually where these moments of things getting tapped are also really complicated around nationality because the internet is not architected in a way that's really about boundedness. And you know, God is forbid that we start moving in a direction where we try to start bounding it. That's actually a really negative direction for the future of um, you know, technology as well as society. So I, I want to end by asking each of the panelists to give you know, just a minute on what do you think is going to happen next? I'll start with you. Um, well, n since I'll, I'll say one small thing about surveillance, which is that I think the person in the question who, or the person in the audience who asked the question about corporate surveillance and um, how this Sorry. is used in other forms, I think that's going to be the most interesting and, and in some ways alarming um, uh, disclosures uh, about this. I think it just, it, every time I read another, there was one in the New York Times uh, a few days ago, but every time one reads about um, how this 
data is used. Um, to me, it, it just reminds me of going on my Gmail or and 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 seeing, you know, people want to sell me tennis tickets because I happen to, you know, take an interest in tennis. Who gave them that information? Why? Why is my Google search different than Peter's Google search and and so forth? So I, I think that's, uh, in a sense, the most fascinating and least known aspect of all this. Um, what I what I want to have happen as a journalist. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and what I'm, you know, what I can do, and what others journalists to do, is to try to tell these stories that we've been talking about here, and that are very kind of legalistic stories in some respects, much more dramatically and compellingly, so that it's not just a couple hundred people here who come and listen attentively, but that so really broad swaths of the American public um, kind of understand the human consequences in terms of harm that is being done now to people like Laura Poitras and other journalists and to a large number of Muslims in America, I think, as well. Um, I think that journalists need to, and I hope in, in the, the near future, that a lot of these stories that we're kind of talking about on an abstract, statistical, numerical, legalistic level, which is a necessary thing to do, talking about in those ways. Additionally, um, we tell these stories in dramatic narrative, ways on the printed page, on computers, visually, photographically, so that people really kind of get it in the gut as well as in the head. I would like to have a hopeful future direction to this. <laughs> um, I can't say I've gotten there yet. Um, I think that we are going to see continue or increasing levels of distrust um, both uh, with regard to the government, with regard to corporations, and in particular the corporate actors who aren't necessarily the most visible, because one of the characters we didn't talk about in all of this is third-party corporations that the government actually employs or, or acquires data from, um, or steals data from, um, that you know plays a different set of role in all of this, because a lot of the analysis we're going to see is going to be happening by consultants or contractors. I think that as we increase the level of distrust, we actually do ourselves a disservice, and I think that it, it really weakens the foundations of American democracy. And I think that one of the things that's hard for me to watch is that um, I think that we're using the security justification um, to move in a direction that undermines the freedoms that this country is built upon, um, and we're not putting into place the checks and balances. In fact, we're eroding the checks and balances because we think that we need to move faster for security purposes. And I think that that security narrative is really disconcerting. And I think that this is where we're going to see an interesting tension from the technology community who has already been and always been fascinated by the importance of transparency. And I think that that tension of the importance of transparency in light of a culture of secrecy is going to become an even more um, visible element. And I think that we're going to see a lot more whistleblowing. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to be positive. <laughs> I think that, um, that we're going to see as a result of this a lot more public reporting, and I think it's going to be written into law. So um, there are a number of proposals pending in Congress right now to increase the public reporting both about intelligence activities, um, particularly under FISA, um, as well as the legal justifications for those. And uh, we see it now, the intelligence community has a website, so they're periodically putting some things up um, on a Tumblr site I see on the record, um, and so that's happening. But I think we're gonna see that, uh, I think we'll probably see some action from Congress in this area. My own view is that it, it might be better if the increase in public reporting were done in a more regularized um, process so that the public would sort of expect to know that in some periodic way there would be a calendar of times when releases would happen and either summaries of reports or information of what's been going on in the last quarter, something like that, maybe with respect to compliance matters or legal opinions or something. Um, that that would be done in a more regularized way instead of sort of an ad hoc way, but I think we definitely will see some action on that front. Great. Uh, well, thank you all for coming tonight, and thank you to uh, our hosts, of which I guess we're one. So uh, it was a great evening, and you were a great audience. <laughs>